uh, recording. <clears throat> so um, yesterday, um, we uh, st spoke a little bit about the vision, um, the perspective of systems data science, um, uh, this uh, uniting, synergizing, and complementing of, of, on the one hand, system science, the other hand, data science. Um, system science, the science of the whole, seeks to, to understand complex phenomena in the world, the functioning of a complex health system, um, the, the, the backups and delays and, um, uh, and uh, difficulties in access that may be uh, associated with that system. Or maybe it's the spread of communicable diseases, or, or perhaps it's uh, the high, um, high burdens of, of diseases in certain vulnerable communities. Uh, whatever the issue is, um, uh, systems, uh, system science uh, tends to approach it from the perspective of, of, of understanding the underlying processes that give rise to uh, the phenomena um, which we observe. Um, the, the thought is, like as the analogy from Plato's cave would suggest, um, uh, while what we see uh, with, our, with our eyes is often um, the most immediate manifestation of a problem, um, if we wanna change that situation, if we want to improve it, if we want to bend the curve, if we want to lessen the burden of, of, of uh, health issues in vulnerable communities, lower um, health disparities, uh, we need to understand the components that give rise to it. And uh, this perspective uh, tends, to, tends to turn us uh, to understand the mechanics of how these underlying systems work. And in system science, uh, we commonly use models to probe uh, uh, possible understandings of how these systems in the world work to, to create a, a kind of simplified representation uh, of that system that mimics the behavior of that system, but allows us to to better understand why we see certain phenomena by taking this little micro world, um, understanding its logical implications, its behavior over time, and comparing that to what we see in the real world system. And I argued that that models uh, aren't, uh, you know, uh, not, aren't things that inherently capture the truth of the system. Um, rather, they're learning tools. They're learning prostheses, in the words of my colleague Jeff McDonald. Um, they're ways of, of capturing our thinking in an operational fashion, uh, a fashion that's, that, that's uh, instrumental. We can run it. We can, we can um, uh, ask, what does it imply about behavior over time? Um, and as such, it's not that they necessarily embody the truth, but they speed us towards the truth, but because they allow us to more quickly recognize when our, our cherished ideas about how this part of the system works um, or about why we see this phenomenon just doesn't hold water. They let us take our understanding and critically the understanding of others, put them into the, to the light of day where others can critique them can can improve upon them, can refine them, can challenge them. Um, and part of that is done by just building a model itself that forces us to be very specific about our assumptions. We, we, we put a model down in terms of kind of the, the rules that agents follow or the formulas used in that, in that model, that compartmental model, that system dynamics model that says, you know, how many people are going to the hospital per day or what have you. And by putting that down in the model um, explicitly, we're, we're stating our assumptions um, consciously 
and, and in a fashion that's uh, more transparent. And that allows others to disagree. It allows others to say, I believe we actually know better than this now, um, or we need to instead um, uh, you know, represent it like X, Y, or Z. And that doesn't require the others to be modelers. No, 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 no. Often it's, it's from a broad team. And by putting it down in that form, by putting down those compartments or putting up those state charts that we saw, those kind of diagrams with those yellow, um, yellow boxes and transitions between them, um, oh, that can allow others to point out omissions, oversights, oversimplifications. Um, that are key. They may say, well, wait a minute, um, with, with something like gonorrhea, you can't just talk about all infectives. We have to distinguish between asymptomatic infectives um, and symptomatic infectives um, and, and represent the fact that you know, women are associated with, with greater risk of, of uh, asymptomatic infection here um, and therefore going for, for long periods of time undetected. Um, or maybe uh, we're interested in representing, you know, a um, progress of a chronic disease, and and they point out that uh, we need to represent, you know, a, a, a precursor to that um, to that condition, pre-diabetes, not just not just diabetes, and we need to think about the complications of diabetes. So often, just putting putting things down in a model in an explicit form. Um, consciously sort of sketching out our understanding in pencil, as it were, uh, allows others to build upon it, to critique it, to, ref to help us refine it. And that's a major advantage of modeling. It takes it out of our, takes it out of our head, um, where it's often inchoate and it's, it's not perhaps fully defined, not precise. And it puts it down in a form that is precise. When I say precise here, I don't mean accurate necessarily. I mean that it's specific. It's, it's making a, a very particular set of assumptions. And, and that's how we advance our understanding. We bring an interdisciplinary group um, to, to bear um, on this and to critique it. And hopefully, if we have many eyes, people from many backgrounds, um, often from <coughs> diverse experiences um, or knowledge about the system, and they can add, add a lot to that discussion and help refine it. So we have a, a joint understanding that emerges in this model as to what's a plausible working hypothesis out there in the world. And you know, if that, if that were all that modeling involved, it would still be useful, but it goes of course far beyond that. Um, the dynamic modeling at the heart of system science um, takes that model, that model with precise testable assumptions, and then it allows us to, to execute it, to, to, to run it, to say, okay, computer, go figure. If this is what we assume, what would it imply about behavior over time? If this is how we believe people interact with parks and convenience stores and grocery stores, what would that imply about what we'd expect to see about the relationship between the distance from a grocery store and people's weight or the distance from park and people's weight? Um, what would we expect to see from this model in terms of the, the number of, of um, asymptomatic infectives over time? or about the number of people going to the hospital. And of course, by, by running it, then we can compare it with, with data um, observed from the world. And often it's that step, not merely the step of putting it down in, in, um, you know, on paper, as it were, that, that allows us to further refine our model because now it's being held up and asked to account for observations from the world. It's, it's being tested against the crucible of evidence in a phrase I used yesterday. Um, and often there we draw on a large number of stakeholders too. We not, not only compare it 
against um, data explicitly collected from the world, um, you know, in the form of time series, as valuable as they are, or in terms of, of data points, but we compare it against people's experience, people's lived experience. Um, we compare it against um, the observations of system stakeholders throughout the system. And often they bring um, important observations to the table that may not be codified in you know, published published um, uh, estimates of certain quantities or in formal observations, but they may note things like, oh yeah, the big cycles here, or it's always worse around the holidays, or you know, um, uh, sometimes it, it goes up quickly, but then it takes a long time to come down. These aren't numbers, but they are, they are aspects of the situation um, to which we, we expect the model to hold true. Um, and, and we can often critique a model with those sorts of observations. Or perhaps we know that you know, the burden is higher among women than men, and, and we, we capture that with a model, that, that, that constraint. It's not that we have perhaps a particular number, um, but we know it's a lot worse among, among women or men, compared to men, and we expect the model to, to reproduce it. And if it doesn't, that's cause for starting to refine our assumptions in the model. So um, here, you know, models are part of a human theater. And um, often there's many facts about a system, many observations, many aspects of tacit knowledge or informal knowledge that's never written down that people carry around. And, and a modeling project um, can often really bring those out by bringing people together with the model. It's not so much just the model as an artifact, but it's the modeling that often is really useful here. Um, and as such, um, a model serves as a boundary object to use the language of social science, um, a, a language, uh, an object in which people from, from multiple backgrounds, diverse, life experiences, diverse areas of familiarity with the system, perhaps patient and family advisors, uh, people, people with, with lived experience of a certain condition, as well as you know, physicians, as well as public health practitioners, as well as health economists, um, epidemiologists, biostatisticians can gather. And by gathering around it, they can point and, and look at that model and talk um, with some point of confidence that they're speaking about the same area of the system or what have you. Whereas if they're using their jargon, if they're using their Linnaean names for, for you know, uh, a given pathogen, or if they're, if they're using a vernacular slang, you know, the, the communication is inhibited. But a model often serves as that kind of point of, of common reference. Um, and there's been a lot of work done on, on the participatory modeling process and, and how it can be, um, uh, you know, can, can really be transformative in bringing people from diverse backgrounds together to have discussions um, and, and work towards uh, a common cause um, in advancing the underlying situation. So it's not that models are some sort of crystal ball that either hold permanently true or or offer no value. No, it's it's there 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 uh, an element of the human theater that can can leverage can help um, actualize understanding from across a broad group can elicit it in ways that would otherwise remain remain untapped. Um, to jointly advance understanding and to, to learn more effectively. Um, and I tied this in yesterday to the idea of a learning organization, um, something to which many of our health systems now aspire, um, but where uh, often there's understated um, or under, uh, there, there's an under conceptualization of how to learn and modeling can be, can be one of those tools that can be very effective at helping to enable modeling. Um, 
and it, again, it's, it's not that we look for models to be right. It's we look for them to take some stance, test it out, fail early, fail often, but fail forward um, to, to, to learn from it. Um, um, as I like to put it, um, uh, as Francis Bacon put it, um, you know, one, one sooner learns uh, through error uh, than from confusion. Uh, it's more effective to take, to try some idea out, test it and advance it um, than it is to just remain confused. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we do with dynamic modeling. But dynamic modeling, I argued yesterday um, in my, sort of system science vision talk, you know, has a number of limitations. The models that we build amongst other things often quickly grow obsolete. Um, they don't stay current, they don't stay fresh, and they can start to seem less relevant because their initial situation is increasingly at odds with what's observed. Or uh, the dynamics they expect is, is now um, outdated or antiquated or doesn't reflect the latest economic trends or latest understanding or latest data. Um, uh, more than that, um, the models um, often uh, haven't really had that opportunity built with traditional tools to tap in to uh, as diverse a set of, of data as, as they um, could fruitfully tap. Um, and, and models of this sort um, often um, uh, under, um, undervalue uh, the, the large amounts of data that, that can now be tapped within the system and don't fully exploit that in their understanding. The model captures theory and assumptions as it was when it was created or last calibrated or parameterized, but it's not being kept um, current. Um, it's not being kept uh, abreast of, of these latest changes. Um, so, you know, those are some limitations uh, on the modeling front that we often see. And I contrapose that to, to data science, this newer, but very rapidly expanding and prominent field, um, which seeks to leverage the diversity of, 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 of data that's out there, um, diversity of observations, um, to understand the world more effectively through a data-driven lens. And here, there's often uh, a, a particular interest in leveraging sort of rich, rich newer data sources that come from big data, um, things like uh, electronic health records, things like the, uh, the ad administrative data, um, wastewater data, data from social media, data from search, um, uh, search volumes, um, uh, data from websites, et cetera. And, and leveraging that to better understand what's going on in the world um, in a fashion that makes fewer presuppositions and that leaves us more open to discovery from the patterns we see in the data. Now, this is an incredibly powerful tool and it's led to the ability to, to ferret out distinctions um, uh, that otherwise remain hidden. Often there's hidden order in things, um, but we don't see it through a normal lens. But with the lenses of, of data science, often these, these hidden patterns um, can be resolved. We can recognize that there's a structure there and recognize distinctions that may allow us to have better diagnostic criteria, better resolve different phenotypes or endotypes of a, of a certain condition, say long COVID, that, that otherwise is grouped together in an undifferentiated, a less differentiated way. Um, it may allow us to, to better 
come up with strategies for early detection of a, of a problem, you know, to recognize that, that a person using social media um, needs help in terms of um, distressing thoughts that might lead to suicidal ideation, perhaps allowing us to, to early on detect an individual at high risk of, um, of long COVID and, um, and connect them with the specialists they may need ahead of time or prepare their family to watch out for certain conditions um, or build education for them. It may allow us to, to better identify high risk cases for mental health and prioritize them in terms of, um, of, of uh, quicker access to clinical help or, um, or better linking them up to resources um, that, that might aid them, such as helplines, et cetera. Prioritizing regions, perhaps, of high, of high, high coming likely burden, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of potential here. Um, the tools of data science can, can tease out relationships that otherwise would go unrecognized. And by so doing, it can, um, can help us. Um, but once again, there's some, um, and we, well, I should say we saw yesterday that there's a set of tasks that are included in this broad um, rubric of, of uh, machine learning, uh, tasks of discovery and, and description, where we identify this hidden structure, tasks of prediction, where we can have ways of classifying or predicting some sort of outcome. Um, and, and then we, we saw that some newer data science and in a way that directly reflects this confluence with system science is, is starting to recognize the limitations of those approaches and looking at techniques that are causally based. And there were three primary motivations for this I characterized. Number one, the desire for explicability, for, to be able to explain why this is such an effective diagnostic strategy, why we believe high-risk individuals can be spotted in this way, um, why we believe this trend is likely to accelerate or what have you. It's one, one motivation for causal method, methods. Another is um, not merely out of sample prediction, but out of distribution prediction. The, 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 the desire to take our predictive models and bring them to a different context, from one city to another, one country to another, um, from rural to urban or vice versa, et cetera. And causal structures in the world um, are generally much more conserved uh, than you know, the happenstance of, of, of patterns um, that are not causally based. And so by finding causal patterns, we, we find um, more reliable and robust um, ways of, of, say, describing or classifying um, uh, and, and predicting outcomes. But the third reason was to reason about counterfactuals, to reason about um, if we change something, how would it affect things? To be able to allow us to identify points of high leverage. Because we may discover a strong, strong, strong association between two conditions that is not a causally driven association one way or the other. And if we think we're going to you know, invest in one and change the other, we may be, we, we may be you know, woefully mistaken. Um, and the early day, the early experience of machine learning in the health sphere is riddled with cases where, you know, um, exciting associations, patterns that are intriguing have been found, but where upon intervention that try to take advantage of that, it's found to not, to not in fact hold causal water and and it doesn't achieve the desired, um, the desired effect. Companies have gone under from, from um, uh, these misplaced hopes in this regard. But, but you know, the rise of, 
of causal um, machine learning and, and, and causal data science um, is part of this bringing together of system science and data science. Um, it heralds this, this era of, of coming up with strategies that are based on, on um, causal understanding, conscious attention to causal understanding, but which can exploit um, the richness of data that's increasingly available. And, uh, and this is of enormous value to system science too, because these methods also keep our, keep our simulation models, for example, which capture our understanding more nimble. They let them incorporate new data, let them learn the hallmark of machine learning um, uh, over time. They help them refine their estimates of parameters or their understanding of the current state of the system. They help them learn which inter, you know, what the effects of interventions are. And they might even help them going forward, learn aspects of, of system structure or select better models, select models that are likely to be more effective in, in, in capturing the dynamics of the situation. So I argued yesterday for this emerging discipline of, of, of systems data science, a whole greater than the sum of the parts. It's not merely data science and, and system science bolted together. Um, it takes each and leverages the other. And I had alluded briefly to some other ways that I didn't emphasize in which these two can be drawn together. For example, system science approaches, things like agent-based modeling, or discrete event simulation, these individual level formulations being used as test beds to test out analytic strategies like machine learning to classify things. Um, and, and they provide almost ideal test beds because they, they are a depiction of a situation where we know the underlying truth, but it has the kind of look and feel of the real situation and we can produce data comparable to real world data and test how well our machine learning algorithms for classifying um, uh, the underlying situation really hold up. Identify their blind spots, identify where they fall short, where they need to be extended, uh, where their assumptions are fraught, et cetera. And by so doing, we advance those. So, you know, taken, taken together, what this is all about is learning to um, learning uh, how to how to uh, navigate more effectively, decide more more uh, in, a, in a more high leverage way, a more robust and resilient way, um, in a complex world, in a complex shifting world, by leveraging understanding across an organization, um, whether qualitative or quantitative. And, under, and, and leveraging data uh, of diverse sorts, uniting the two in a way that supports constant learning and failing early, failing often, discovering when we do have oversights, when we do have oversimplifications, when we do have omissions, um, when we do have um, misconceptions about this system, we discover it early, can refine them, and, and, uh, and do better uh, over time. And, and that's you know, very much part of this ethos of the learning organization. This is what the, the linking of, of data science and system science um, heralds. Um, there's, there's many components to this. And today we're gonna be looking at some, some of the methods that, that help um, bring home this promise. Uh, we're going to be looking at three methods today in coming hours um, that uh, provide ways of leveraging the power of data together with uh, the power of, of um, uh, theorizing and thereby can help us cross check our theory and challenge our theory as well as evidence it when it is substantiated. Um, so we're going to start small and simple. We're going to be talking about the ubiquitous or near ubiquitous uh, method of calibration. Um, 
not not because it's only a, a systems data science approach, but because it also provides a good point of reference for understanding more sophisticated approaches. And it is a premier way of leveraging data with models. Um, one that has limitations, but one that's often a starting point. Uh, we'll then talk about uh, approximate Bayesian computation, which provides us kind of a generalization of calibration, still very readily accessible, very readily deployable with any of the dynamic modeling types, but which gives us greater power. It, it lets us, lets us avoid putting our eggs in the basket of certain parameter values and, and considering a wide range of parameter values um, in a fashion that's very easily implemented. Um, and, and this is important when the evidence is such that we can't pin down ourselves to, to one set of assumptions that, that explains that, that data from the world. Um, We'll also be looking at, uh, also as a kind of point of departure, a, uh, a method called hidden Markov modeling. Um, and hidden Markov modeling is, uh, is a tried and true, very widely deployed uh, machine learning technique uh, based in Bayesian reasoning, Bayesian probabilistic reasoning, uh, Bayesian statistics, which, um, provides us a way of reasoning about the behavior of a dynamical system over time and, and, and getting a reading on what the underlying situation is in that system. But it does so in a very simple context. that will be very useful as we go on to compare with more sophisticated methods. Uh, and in hidden Markov modeling uh, can be very useful for understanding um, a wide variety of types of the implications of types of big data uh, that we'll be, um, we'll be surveying. So having, having looked at those three techniques today, um, uh, we will also be returning to this issue of big data late in the day. Um, we'll be um, expanding a little bit our discussion yesterday of the two initial types of big data. On the one hand, um, discussion of, of search data, something you explored, something that can that has its limitations, but can reveal seasonal patterns, can reveal um, uh, some understanding of what people are searching for related to a condition, can reveal trends, can reveal shifts in awareness or, or attitudes, can reveal needs for information in a certain area. We saw that some yesterday. Um, uh, and where you know thoughtful choice of what search queries to examine um, and over what time frame and what geographic characterization can often give us some pretty significant insights for almost free. I mean, it's it's a very easy to use um, interface. We also looked uh, or talked a little bit about um, social media data, tweets and and uh, other social media such as Reddit that are self-publishing platforms. Um, and I noted that as self-publishing platforms, the privacy expectations here are minimal and often we can pick up signal in this area that's much richer. Um, it's different from what we see with search data in the sense that it points to a, a community of discourse that can pick up different types of messages and topics um, in a way that is often not just a reflection of, but shaping um, people's, under, uh, people's knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. And it does so in a fashion that's temporal and which can often be localized within some geographies. Very, very powerful that um, for many, to whom I speak, um, there's an interest also in risk communication to those communities. And what we pick up in the theater of social media can shape our understanding of messaging needs, of adapting messaging needs, 
and messaging means to different subcommunities. Um, we won't get into that here, but it's a very powerful um, um, resource in the context of risk communication. Now, um, today we're going to be going on and talking about two additional sorts. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about smartphone-based data collection, um, which you know attracted considerable attention during the pandemic, but is something we've been doing for well over a decade now, and um, and and where their platforms, such as our Ethica data platform, used worldwide in hundreds of studies, which can make smartphone-based data collection from consenting individuals, uh, explicitly consenting individuals, extremely easy, and uh, in most studies required no programming, um, but readily deployed, readily updated, um, readily gathered data, including sensor data and including um, data from from surveys in a way that can be tailored uh, to have very different configurations for different studies. So we'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, and I'll then go on and also talk about an area which I'm very involved with across multiple sectors, which is wastewater-based data collection. Um, something which again has achieved prominence in COVID-19 pandemic, but we were working on it uh, well, prior to that, with broader interests, and it has great potential on a cross-sectoral basis in spheres such as um, uh, understanding pharmacoepidemiology, um, 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 you know, changes in, in ph pharmaceutical use, uh, dietary trends within the population, and and uh, dietary shifts. You know, in the light of, say, higher food prices, et cetera. Um, narcotics use is an area we're highly involved. Um, and even things such as uh, stress dynamics in the population with, uh, uh, with hormones present in wastewater from things like cortisol levels can give really important insights. Um, there's many other spheres in which wastewater epidemiology can provide a great deal of insight. And just one sample of wastewater can often be analyzed from many different aspects of of, um, uh, of, of people's behavior um, and uh, uh, people's uh, current, current situation. So we'll be looking at that. And late today, we'll, we'll be expanding a little bit more on the Twitter and, and uh, social media area by uh, a guest lecture by one of my doctoral students, um, uh, Yuan Tian, who will be speaking about um, leveraging Twitter data and classifying tweets using machine learning techniques uh, to get insights into, um, into disease burden. And we'll have some exercises uh, with exploring tweets for those interested um, and others could do a, a deeper dive into how the machine learning for tweets uh, works. Um, if, if you'd like to understand in nitty gritty terms, how one processes tweets using machine learning, um, how one takes a whole set of tweets and classifies them in mechanical terms, um, uh, that will be covered in one of the breakouts as, uh, as well. Um, so we do have a, a full day today, um, but as always, one of my biggest hopes is to address your questions, your needs, um, and I've updated the schedule a little bit to try to reflect my sense of that. But I want to ask now, so are there any topics people would like to ask or discuss here um, um, that would like to you know, put forward um, for a bit of discussion before we get started with, with lectures? Anything people that's on people's minds you'd like to, to talk about? I have a question. Great. Um, so I'm a ma I am pursuing a master's degree in biostatistics, and I was wondering, um, because for a biostatistics you could work. I was wondering if, if if it's possible to also work as like a data scientist and how that's different from a biostatistician. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Um. Biostatisticians and data scientists um, uh, have 
I, I would call them um, at the least cognate areas, but I would argue that some biostatistics statistics is pursued under a data science uh, rubric and um, or, or it could be viewed as as an element of, of data science. Um, uh, I would say, uh, you know, yesterday I talked um, in my my look at AI, big data, um, data science, um, uh, I, and machine learning, I, I talked a little bit about how what distinguishes um, traditional statistics, biostatistics, and um, uh, what is called machine learning these days is not so much the methods, but often how they're applied and the research questions that are being pursued with them. Um, and this is a little bit of a fuzzy area. And certainly some of my most esteemed colleagues in machine learning are also stati statisticians, for example. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's, there's actually um, a diversity of reasonable opinions um, that about, you know, when we say machine learning, um, to what degree does traditional statistics fit into um, what could reasonably be viewed as, as parts of machine learning. I would say that, um, you know, biostatistical tools, the tools you learn in biostatistics in a, in a master's program of biostats uh, can certainly be very valuable uh, in pursuing data science needs. They can be applied to big data. They can be applied with cross-validation they can be applied in the context of a desire to come up with a prediction or description mechanisms for discovery or for you know, uh, classification schemes, et cetera, um, and can do so with, with novel data sources, et cetera. Um, I tend to be syncretic in my uh, approach to things, and I personally don't, don't feel it's that useful to kind of say, this is not, you know, this should not be counted as, as machine learning. I think that often there's, a, there's more to be gained by joint understanding um, of these methods and by thinking about how they can be used together than by drawing boundaries and saying, this is not machine learning. But I would say that, you know, data science um, often involves attention and need for, um, for being aware of the ability to apply these methods against larger data sets, which are traditionally um, not something where you can apply, um, or I'm not putting that well, the, um, in tradition, the tools of traditional statistics, the way in which parameters are estimated, for example, often don't scale to the sizes of data we often will deal with in, in big data. Um, and there you often have to change your method of estimating parameters to reflect the scale of that data. If you're dealing with hundreds of millions of data points, for example, um, you may be not able, you know, you're not able to apply um, uh, a, a classic algorithm for, for, for calculating in closed form using all the data at once what the optimal parameter values are. Um, uh, so I, I, I do think that, yes, you could pursue data science um, needs. And I think, um, you know, if you're working with administrative data or with larger uh, larger data sources, um, electronic health record data, um, data that involves, uh, you know, diverse um, observations, um, you may kind of fall into the data science paradigm without even intending, intending it. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly there are some uses of biostatistics using it with, um, in a, in a context of cross-validation and using it 
to identify effective prediction mechanisms, um, to, to recognize uh, hidden structure using, using things like uh, clustering, et cetera, which would kind of make it quite clearly biostatistics. Bio so I hope that's, that's helpful. Um, um, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'm glad to, to talk. Um, uh, so question um, from Hind here. Being involved with wastewater as a population surveillance tool, will we have hands uh, on practical applications? I think is what was meant. Development of an algorithm for detecting um, emergence or transmission of pathogens. I'm thinking spatial heterogeneity and application to the full province. Um, so, um, uh, so wastewater data is one of the areas that we'll be covering uh, in practical substance um, with some of the tools starting tomorrow. So we'll be looking at tools that consume with uh, rather um, uh, with 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 uh, um, some enthusiasm, wastewater data, um, and and link it in to models. And one of the options there is to go deep on those models and in, in one of the breakout sessions to look at how they can make use of uh, the data sources, and we could feature wastewater there if you're interested in in doing that. Um, uh, so uh, we're working with wastewater data across several of the modeling types um, covered here uh, in, in areas um, that span from communicable disease to, uh, to, to narcotics and, and mental health and addictions needs. Um, and one of the folks here, um, well, I would mention three people here that you might want to talk to more about this. Um, one is Wade McDonald's. He's a doctoral student um, who's um, been getting immersed in the wastewater sphere um, and um, is, is earlier in his progression um, on this, but in, is, we're working towards linking it with agent-based modeling. Uh, and uh, he's already working with models um, of two of the sort that, that we're going to be covering within this boot camp for particle filtering, particle MCMC. Jalen Mikulik, uh, also here, has been uh, working extensively with that. And Xiao Yan Li, one of the other TAs, has been working with wastewater data since, um, gosh, late, late 2020 um, and linking that in in a central way and in a path breaking way um, with these types of models. Um, she's um, and arguably the most sophisticated, uh, has the most sophisticated tool set with respect to linking wastewater data into data science techniques um, uh, in, uh, in this country. Although again, that's, that's arguable and, and there's some other groups doing great work too. So um, those three are TAs for this event. And if you'd like to reach out to them, um, I'm sure they'd be glad to, to talk um, you know, uh, on the side about that, et cetera. But we'll be having explicit discussion of this issue. And starting today, we'll be talking about wastewater. Wastewater, I believe, has huge implications for us in epidemiology. And it is a data source that's geographically, temporally, you know, finer grained, uh, and, uh, and which can provide the variety of data that is characteristic of, of big data. It can provide data on a, a set of different measurements. And we'll talk about that later today because it, it's variety at several different levels um, of analysis. So, um, uh, so how does complexity science fit in with systems and da uh, systems data science? Um, um, I know there's a lot of overlap, but as a subgroup, right? Um, do they use certain special boundaries for, um, uh, where only problems of feedback scaling considered, or do they have overlap and then do unique things? Um, yeah, it's a very good, very good question. So I'll, I'll, I'll make my comments here. Um, and uh, I don't know that I've been asked this before, but I'll, uh, that's why I especially like the question. Um, so in my view, 
um, the terms data science, sorry, excuse me, put that aside. The term system science and complexity science are basically synonyms um, as I use them and as many communities of practice use them. Complexity science is an older established term. Um, uh, and system science was a term that achieved prominence in the uh, kind of in the aughts, in the 2000s, um, and was particularly uh, promoted amongst other things by, by USNIH, including my colleague, Patty Mabry, a current valued collaborator of our group, um, who, who then was the most prominent um, system science proponent um, in the, the health uh, funding sphere in the US through the Office of Behavioral Social Science Research at the NIH. Um, and system science caught on as a term um, in a way that uh, I don't think is bad, but complexity science is an older established term. And when I was first uh, exploring um, complexity science methods in 1990, I worked at some early pioneers in that area and, and complexity science was a thing there. Um, um, I, I, I think the term complexity is, is at once useful and, and also in some ways um, perhaps, um, um, you know, it, it, some, it misses some marks. Um, it's very useful because we're talking about complex systems here. We're talking about systems that exhibit complexity. They're bigger than the sum of the parts. They're not just heaps of parts. We have to deal with the connections. And it's kind of like, th think about a, a, you know, a, a traffic jam. A traffic jam is not merely about the cars in it. You could know all the world about the axle sizes of the cars and their engine types and the, the you know, their makes and the size of the body of the cars. And you'd know nothing about, of substance about traffic jams, their dynamics and how to solve them and why they form. That's not about the cars. It's, it's about something different than the cars. It, yeah, is it about cars? Yeah, it wouldn't exist without cars or about, without vehicles, but it's also about visibility and it's about the angles of the road and it's about you know, the driving conditions and it's about the number of, of entries, but it's about all those and they're all tangled up um, and manifest in this emergent behavior of a traffic jam. And complexity science is about these complex systems that are where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And we're surrounded by those systems. Any, any you know, substantive health issue these days um, at the population level almost invariably involves some element of complexity. It's a complex system, whether it's long waiting times in emergency rooms, which you know, turn out to have their roots over in the community, lack of community services and inability to discharge people there, and, things that drive people in un unnecessarily for conditions because they're not getting community services, and, you know, problems in the wards, et cetera. Um, that's a complexity of science problem. When we look at the problem of opioids and opioid abuse and overdoses, I and mean, it's complexity science issues there. When we look at the burden of mental health issues and, and uh, disruption of support groups and inability to, to access care in a timely fashion and transmissibility of depression, these are complexity science phenomena as well. Um, um, uh, you know, pretty much any, any substantive hard problem is a complexity science problem. And some of them are more of our wicked problems, problems where our very value systems have to be re-examined to, to deal with them. But complexity science, um, um, like system science, which I'm using more or less um, interchangeably, it, um, it's, it's about dealing with these systems, but it, one, of, one of its foremost tools, if you heard how I phrased things yesterday, one of its foremost tools is dynamic modeling. That's a foremost tool in its tool set, but it's not the only tool. One of the other methods, which we might get to cover this boot camp, but if it were five days, we would. If it's four days, we might not be able to, but if there were interest, I'd be glad to cover it, is CCF. 
convergent cross mapping. And that leverages techniques from system science other than dynamic modeling. It's not a dynamic modeling technique. It doesn't depend on any particular model. Um, just as yesterday, those curves we saw in terms of hospitalizations or in terms of number of cases where you could kind of, it's like a hurricane curve. You could kind of see where the system is going and project it forward. Those are model free. There's no model imposed there, but they're system science. They're complexity science techniques. They depend on the theory of embedding and, and, and the fact that when we graph things out in that way, a current value versus its lagged components, component as it was yesterday or as it was last month, we're actually getting insight into the, the state of the system. We don't know what that state is, but, but it turns out through taking the theorem, we're getting insight into it. And, and so there are these techniques from complexity science that take advantage of this that are not model-based techniques. And there's analyses of things like um, uh, phenomena of chaos and the ways in which things that look all, all on the face of it like randomness have actually hidden order. And, and, um, and you can get those phenomena that look almost, uh, almost random, but are in fact ordered, um, have hidden order. Um, in, in, under some simple conditions with, um, with systems. Um, and you know, it looks at under what conditions emergence occurs and, and, um, and what it means for a system to adapt and how to measure transitions in a system and phase phenomena where a system gets into a lock-in state, which you can't get out of with you know, high rates of mental health and, and, and mental health distress. Um, uh, that is very hard to then extract ourselves from. It's much easier to prevent than it is to, to deal with once it's developed. Think addiction, for example, as, as, a, as a good example of that, or think endemic, you know, an endemic uh, establishment of a disease. There's many, there's many phenomena in complexity science that aren't, norm, that aren't reducible to just modeling, but modeling is a key tool in that toolbox because to identify to reason about complex systems with certain types of questions, what if questions, uh, in questions about interventions, we need complexity science techniques. So these systems we're dealing with from the world are all about complexity science. And complexity science tells us something of great relevance as boot camp. And I, I should have emphasized it early, and I'm so grateful for this question to emphasize it now. Data science traditionally has underserved our ability to understand the world through data. That's a strong statement, but traditional data science, one that doesn't take into account complexity science, system science has underserved our ability to draw insight from the world through data. Why do I say that? Because traditional data science has taken data as, as telling us about the part of the system that is measured. So we take a measurement of waiting times in the ER and it, we say, this is about waiting times in the ER. It's data about waiting times in the ER. Um, we take measurements about people's self-reported um, levels of depression over time in the community. And we say that's about depression. Um, we take measurements of the number of people um, who are being admitted to hospital each time and we say that's about that component. Maybe we try to predict it, or maybe we try to you know, um, uh, reason about uh, how to classify if it's about to change, but we're focused just on that narrow thing. And what system science tells us, what complexity science tells us is that when you have these complex systems, when you have these, these systems where the whole is greater than some of the parts, coupled nonlinear dynamical systems, if I'm to lapse into the technical jargon. When you have those, um, knowing about a piece of the system actually tells you about a broader set of understanding of the system. Now that sound, may sound like a strange statement, but humor me for a second. Um, uh, if, we, um, um, if we were to, um, to say, you know, the waiting times in the ER are extremely long. That actually tells us 
that probably the wards are backed up as well. It tells us something about what's going on in the hospital wards. So people are admitted overnight as inpatients. It tells us probably that's full. Otherwise, they'd be able to move people out of emergency. It doesn't tell us for sure, but it says that that's, that's likely. Um, you know, to, to use an ecological example, um, if we have, um, you know, uh, if we have lynxes and hares and the lynxes hunt the hares and, and, um, and if we see right now a very, 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 um, very high uh, population of hares, it probably tells us the lynx population is going to be growing quickly because they love eating hares. And um, if we're seeing a very high number of hares, it tells us something about that lynx population. And if the lynx population is super high, it probably tells us that, you know, uh, the hare population is getting um, heavily eaten by, by lynx. Um, when we have these dynamical systems, we, um, you know, they're coupled, they're, 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 they're um, kind of promiscuous, things going on in one area ripple over to things elsewhere. Um, if we have lots of people coming into the hospital, it tells us something about the number of cases uh, as well, the amount of transmission in the system. In short, when we measure things in a complex system, it's never just about that part of the system. It's whispering to us, if we can just listen in the right way, about things going on elsewhere in the system. And there's a formal theory about how to listen correctly, how to listen acutely and with sensitivity about what it's telling you about things elsewhere in the system. And that's what the theory of delay embedding is about. Um, and that's why those plots with the so-called hurricane plots with the swooping number of hospitalizations or cases where you plot X against X yesterday, that's why those work so well. They, they're capturing the underlying structure, the underlying state space of the system. It tells you something about where it's going the state space of the system, not just about the piece you measure. So from a data science perspective, uh, it, it really underserves our ability to treat data about that's measured from part X of the system as if it's only about part X of the system. We should be listening for what it tells us about the broader system, all the factors driving it. And this provides the basis of detecting causal connections within systems, incidentally, which Wade McDonald has explored wonderfully within uh, the CCM area, the convergent cross mapping area. So these are tools of system science, complexity science that, that are highly relevant for, for upping our game on the data science side. And data science will benefit from, from these tools um, uh, in its ability to, you know, apply the, the trade of, 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 um, of data science. So complexity science and system science I view is largely, um, uh, largely, uh, uh, largely the same, um, but it's important to recognize they're more than just modeling. Modeling is a component of it, but there's a lot more there beyond just building models and and some of that other components are very relevant in the context of, um, of, of uh, data science. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, uh, uh, let's see, um, what is computational epidemiology? Um, so um, computational epidemiology involves the use of computational informatics tools uh, to reason about uh, the burden and evolution of, um, um, well, about, about, I shouldn't say burden, that's kind of phrasing it in a, um, in, in a unnecessarily um, uh, negative fashion. It's about to understand um, health and the health of populations, the evolution of that health and, um, and disparities in the, bur uh, in the burdens on that health within the population. Uh, geographically and, and along different factors. Um, it's use of computational tools, um, and it mirrors uh, a term mathematical epidemiology, which um, is a long established tool uh, um, in, based on mathematical techniques for understanding um, the health of populations. Um, 
uh, but has been particularly prominent within the communicable and infectious disease area. And so computational epidemiology is about using you know, computational informatics tools beyond the mathematical tools uh, for understanding these factors. And I would include their data science uh, techniques as part of kind of the, the, the canon of, of computational methods these days. Um, um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, um, pi PM method. Um, sure. Um, Pi PM, gosh, um, um, I, this is not a term I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, uh, model, I'll, I'll just go uh, look it up. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Wade. Um, this, uh, this looks cool. Um, uh, so um, mumble, um, uh, okay, connected systems with discrete time difference equations. Uh, oh, okay, okay, yeah, sure. Um, so this is one particular um, one particular way of describing this class of systems, discrete time difference equations. Sure. Um, so um, discrete time difference equations are systems that are um, closest. They have a closest relationship to um, uh, to system dynamics um, uh, modeling. Um, system dynamics modeling is the mathematics of it translate into what are called differential equations, and there's a continuous time um, uh, characterization of a system evolves. Um, so time is continuous, meaning it's not. You're not just jumping from one month to the next, to the next, to the next, or one year to the next, to the next, to the next, but rather it's it's viewed as as, as continuously evolving, um, and uh, it is um, uh, and it involves you know these compartments, these stocks, um, changing over time with those um, as time evolves. Um, PPM clearly is, is using difference equations. Difference equations are kind of, um, okay, I, I'm probably gonna get people mad at me for saying this, but um, uh, I think of them as kind of a poor person's um, side of differential equations, but I, 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 I shouldn't say that. Um, the truth is they are widely used in some areas like, um, uh, like econometrics. Um, they basically characterize in discrete time. So what that means is it's not discrete as in like secret. Uh, it's, it's discrete as in like, um, it's not continuous, meaning it's like time, you know, time zero, time one, time two. So month zero, month one, month two, month three, month four, rather than think of time as continuous. Um, uh, and, and difference equations will update like, the value at time one based on what its value was at time zero, et cetera. Now, PyPM is clearly a Python based, so Python is a programming language. And in fact, it comes along with a, a wide set of libraries that you can use, po programming environments, et cetera. The Anaconda um, sort of ecosystem of, of, of packages um, that, that provide a lot of uh, a lot of libraries, tools, and so on. Um, and um, really, this is kind of a, um, um, a way of doing something a little bit similar to uh, system dynamics modeling, it looks like, in, in uh, discrete, discrete time. So yeah, you have population objects with connectors, which represent transfers. Those are like flows. Um, and you get kind of um, uh, a, a record of the evolution of the system where each stock, each population object records its size. So this is kind of a simplified, um, it's not quite the right word. It's a, it's a uh, uh, alternative way of characterizing these, uh, these systems where it, we're not using a, a continuous time Thing where we have people per day flowing, but we just have people, the number of people like that flow are that transfer from here to here in the context of an entire week. 
Um, and uh, you can use this to, to analyze system behavior in a discrete type framework. Um, now, I, I will tell you, um, full disclosure, I, I do, so I've, I work with discrete time models a lot. Um, I've worked with them for agent-based modeling. I've worked with them for, for um, difference equations a bit. And I'll tell you that it's, in my view, it's much nicer to work in continuous time at several levels. Um, and I'd be glad to expound on that if that, that were interesting, but um, uh, essentially it has to do with the fact there's often competing things going on. If you're doing things only in discrete time, you have to kind of broker the competition that's gone on over since the last time. Whereas if you're doing it continuous time, it's much more natural. Um, and discrete time uh, difference equations, um, they have some complexities to them. It's, um, uh, I prefer working on a continuous time formulation, but some people would probably be different. And I, I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, so this provides us kind of a way of building up something that's kind of like a close cousin of system dynamics modeling, it looks to me. Um, but it looks like it's very particular for population. System dynamics modeling, those stocks and flows or compartmental modeling, you know, you're not, you're not limited to those being populations. Um, yesterday we saw we had susceptibles and exposed and infectives and recovered, people in a hospital, but there was also people who had cumulatively died and there was you know, a number of cumulative infections. But often in a model, we want something more than that. And for dealing with these models of health systems, we might have you know, the amount of money that's been spent on interventions or the um, measures of the quality of life of the population, number of cumulative life years lived of the population, a quality adjusted life years lived. Um, we might want um, stocks, compartments associated with the number of vaccine doses available or, you know, associated with the number of PPEs, um, you know, gloves and, and, and masks or what have you that are available. Um, uh, and when you're building a, a system dynamics model, it's often really advantageous to be able to take advantage of these non-population stocks. So in other words, to have the freedom to have stocks, which are something other than counts of people right now. Um, and it looks like PyPM is really aimed at, at building models where these are compartments of, of people. And, and that's okay, um, but it's restricted. Um, you know, we also build models with service dogs and veterans or where, where we have um, deer and uh, the deer um, are roaming the landscape. Um, I guess that would fit into this, but I was thinking where we have multiple population types, where we have birds, mosquitoes and people, and the people are bitten by mosquitoes and can develop West Nile virus and mosquitoes transmit it back and forth to birds. Um, uh, you know, so we have multiple population types and, and that might, um, you know, ha having the ability to characterize that with different dimensions is kind of a nice feature of system dynamics. I, I, I guess you, you might be able to do it here, but it's uh, you might not be able to distinguish readily between those types of uh, of compartments. But you know, it looks looks to me like a Python Python based way of, of building up these systems. Um, now, I will say, I mean, we're living in a pragmatic world. People on this call have all sorts of different levels of experience with computational tools and programming. One of system dynamics primary draws for people is that, um, well, any tool built in, in, in any logic can be built in a way that um, it's, it, it's fairly accessible to a broad team. So they could critique it, they can make suggestions, they could run it, they could probably alter some assumptions, they could define new scenarios. That's one of its strengths. Um, um, but system dynamics, um, and to a degree, discrete event simulation are tools um, that prize minimizing the amount of code you have to write, um, absolutely minimizing it. Um, 
you can get a certain distance with agent-based modeling and any logic with less writing of code, certainly a lot less than other platforms. But, um, but system dynamics in particular is a tool that since the 80s, um, there have been options available to, to build system dynamics models without code. That's what most platforms have. Um, and uh, it, this graphical interface for drawing it out, where you can draw this out. And you don't write code in a computer science uh, in, in the sense that people commonly think. There's no Python there. You don't have to declare variables you know, and, and initialize them and have for loops and have function calls off to things. It's, it, it's kind of minimal computational um, uh, expectations um, are involved for building up these models in system dynamics. Something like PyPM, well, you gotta know Python. Um, and maybe um, it looks like it has a graphical interface, iPyPM, which can run in a Jupyter notebook. Oh, that's, that's quite nice, uh, that's quite nice. But it still runs in a Jupyter notebook, which requires some code, it looks like, to, to interact with it some. Um, um, looks looks nice. I, I'd say um, uh, some features to recommend it, but it requires more access to programming environments certainly than system dynamics modeling would. Um, system dynamics modeling is um, uh, is something which really puts a premium on allowing people to think about models to characterize them without writing code in a traditional sense, and it's very powerful in that sense. Um, I, do, I don't know if that's helpful, but those are some comments there. Look, look at PyPM. We'll go check it out more. Any, any final questions before we move on to the, uh, to the first topic? Um, we're going to talk some about these coming tools of data science we'll be speaking about. Oh, I'm glad if it's useful. Um, my TAs would be glad to engage about that. And like Maya, if you wanted to take that to to one of the ETAs and said, let's go explore this together. They could probably go and fire up a Jupyter notebook and show you what it looks like and, and you know, basically learn about it together and evaluate it. Like that would be a good thing to do between now and the end of the boot camp. If you'd like to like to do that, I'd welcome that use of TA time to sort of do a deep dive into that and show you some of the trade-offs, et cetera. So just reach out to one of the TAs and um, maybe one of the TAs with uh, substantial Python experience could work with Maya on the PyPM side to explore that. Cool, cool. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, Jupyter Notebooks are a um, central tool within data science. For those not familiar with them, they provide um, an interactive interface, something you know, it goes way back in computer science. Uh, uh, command line prompts have been part of my life since, gosh, the beginning of the 1980s. And, um, uh, and it uses this paradigm for interactively exploring constructs. Um, um, and, uh, and, you know, um, you can graphically often see the results of your actions. You, can undertake it actually and see the results interactively immediately. And, um, and that's a very powerful um, paradigm. Uh, Xiao Yan Li, who's there, um, uh, as one of the graduate students here, um, is working on a, um, a modeling tool that um, uh, is accessed by Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, but Jupyter Notebooks are used extensively in data science for interactive data analysis. And um, they are used for Python, but they can also be used for R. And sort of R Studio has some flavor of that, but there's also R, R-based Jupyter Notebooks, um, J-U-P-Y-T-E-R. Uh, um, very, very, very handy constructs. Um, and this is, Leveraging them clearly for um, uh, for for this um, uh, the sake of of discrete 
time difference equation model. Um, uh, yeah, so sure. So I'm going to ask one of my TAs to, to help Maya and Wendy and anyone else interested. Look, you got that out. Um, uh, and if no one steps forward in the next few hours, um, maybe I'll, I'll meet with the TAs over lunch and we could figure out who, um, who will uh, take the role in, in leading that and, and allowing it to be explored in the next uh, two days. Um, great. Great to explore Jupiter now for our programming. Great, um, great. We'll see if we could do something uh, for that. Um, uh, so um, we'll, we'll we'll see. There's a couple different systems like Kaggle, Collaboratory, and others that use a kind of notebook-like approach, and we we can showcase that. This is great. Okay. We'll make sure these things are featured here. This is exactly the sort of feedback I'm looking for. Happy to do that. And uh, uh, I will say Jupyter Notebooks are one of these areas where system and data science are being meshed, being used for programming now, um, uh, being used for data science, being used for system science as a powerful interaction mechanism. Great. Okay. Any final questions before we dive into? The first topic. Nothing? Okay. Thank you for all the feedback. This is super helpful. And TAs take note. Let's meet over lunch.